um, hello. We will title this segment Seattle and the discovery of a novel use for the compound adenine. Uh, the year is 1959. Now the stellar event of that year was the birth of our delightful daughter Carol. There were other uh, significant events around that time. We moved to Seattle. It was my first commitment full-time to the discipline of hematology. It did lead to the most significant research uh, accomplishment of my career and it sets a stage for my future scientific career. Personally, it was also the time we bought our first house, and it was the uh, first house that we owned in which Carol and Lori lived. But what I will do for in this segment is concentrate on the steps leading to the uh, development of uh, the use of adenine in blood preservation. Now, blood is collected for transfusion, and in 1959, the shelf life, or the time uh, it could be kept before it would no longer be usable, was 21 days. And that was discovered in 1941, and there had been no significant advance up till uh, the time we are talking. And 21 days meant that for most blood centers in the United States, after collection, blood could be used for 21 days. And that meant that uh, of the collective blood, anywhere from 5 to 10 percent would have to be discarded and was wasted. Now for the military, the problem was much more severe. Blood, for example, was collected for the Korean War and also the civilian war in the United States. And it took about 10 days for it to be collected, tested, processed, and shipped to be available in the war theater, which meant that of the 21 days, almost half of it was wasted. The military obviously was tremendously interested in having an extension of the uh, shelf life and in fact their target was about 42 days or double the uh, this was what they were hoping could be achieved because a doubling of the shelf life really meant a tripling of the usage of blood because from 42 days the processing of 10 days was the same now 30 days roughly was available uh, uh, and so uh, this was a, a goal which was well known. Uh, uh, so that is the background and uh, what the addition of adenine, small amounts of adenine to the uh, uh, coagulation anticoagulant preservative solution uh, achieved was to extend the shelf life from 21 to roughly 42 days and um, um, this is essential this was accomplished or discovered in 1960 in 1959 to 1960 uh, and Adenine remains the essential ingredient and with minor modification after 50 years uh, the same anticoagulant preservative remains in use worldwide. 
Now, how did this come about? Well, I have to go back to about 1956. Um, the military draft was still in place, and college graduates, and particularly medical school graduates, had the opportunity to volunteer for the service, for two-year uh, service. And uh, along with the military, there was uh, the United States Public Health Service. And it was possible to serve your time as an officer in the United States Public Health Service. And I applied for uh, uh, a place at the National Institutes of Health, which I was granted. I got a commission in the Public Health Service, and off we went from San Francisco, where I had my residency at Stanford. Stanford was still then in San Francisco. We went to, even I went to Bethesda in 1956, where I had a clinical appointment in the National Institutes of Arthritis and Metabolic Diseases, but uh, I had the opportunity to work uh, in a laboratory. And uh, early on, from some experience I had at Stanford, I was leaning toward hematology and became interested particularly in the red blood cell. But also at NIH, I first became interested in aging, which in retrospect is interesting that now I'm 82 at the time, and I'm still very interested <laughs> in aging, but I was 27 at the time and uh, read what I could about aging and learned, for example, that uh, if one fed rats a complete diet in terms of uh, what they required, all the essential amino acids, vitamins, and so forth, but restricted their cal caloric intake so that they would uh, uh, not grow to their full size if left to eat alone, they would live twice as long. Another observation was that the same species of fish that lived in a cold ocean lived twice as long as the fish who lived in a um, um, more moderate temperature such as the uh, Mediterranean. And there were other observations uh, along that line. So the, uh, aging interested me. And uh, I thought that the red blood cell, which might be a perfect model to study aging, because it is born and circulates for 120 days and then dies or is removed. And so the red blood cell has no nucleus. It doesn't divide in the circulation. And so it just is born, ages, and dies. Well, the problem would be then to separate uh, old cells from not old cells and see if one could find any differences. Well, I tried uh, and tried several methods to do that uh, and did not succeed. I was able to separate young cells from not young cells, but not old cells from not old cells. And the second publication uh, shows the results of separating young cells from not young cells. In any case, uh, even though I did not succeed in that, it seemed important in order to study 
uh, the red blood cell to know a little bit more biochemistry. So I, um, after my two-year completion of my compulsory service, I applied for a fellowship and stayed at the NIH uh, for a year to learn intermediary metabolism and particularly carbohydrate metabolism because I knew the red blood cell depended on carbohydrate metabolism. Uh, incidentally, this was quite a unique. Uh, so far as I know, the NIH had never accepted a fellowship from outside. And uh, uh, it was in the business of granting fellowships from NIH. So they had to set up a mechanism and it probably cost them $15,000 to set it up whereas my salary was $7,500. <laughs> In any case, during that time, I worked on a number of problems, continued some studies about red cells, but uh, became convinced that I wanted to go into hematology. I looked around and uh, searched uh, various programs, and the one that appealed to me most was that of Dr. Clement Finch at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, one of the appeals was not only that he offered a superb training in hematology, but he and his co-workers were working on extending the lifespan or the shelf life of blood. Uh, they had tried several methods uh, and sometimes they got some promising results, but they could not be repeated. But in the process, they worked out the techniques whereby one could study uh, the shelf life of blood. And the specific uh, requirement was that once blood coll was collected, it could be stored or have a shelf, shelf life so that at least 70% of the cells would survive in the recipient of the transfusion. So that was the criteria, and methods had been worked out to determine that. So both the training program and the fact that they were doing studies along extending shelf life and had the te techniques to do so attracted uh, me to the program in Seattle. Well, when I arrived, uh, Dr. Finch uh, told me about two grants that he had, one which had to do with extending the shelf life of blood, and that was an army grant for obvious reasons, the military was interested, but also at the time, 1959, um, um, uh, blood bags were relatively new, having been introduced in the early 1950s. And the requirement was that each lot of bags had to be tested to be sure that blood collected in it would uh, permit a storage period for the time that was allowed at that time, 21 days. So Dr. Finch turned over both these programs to me and um, uh, initially the, the greatest interest was to verify or certify that the bags that Cutter uh, manufacturers were uh, able to sustain a shelf life of 21 days. Uh, he did not initially uh, emphasize studies in blood preservation, but a um, coincidence happened in 19... 59, which uh, whet my appetite. A paper was published 
uh, in, by the Japanese, a gentleman named Nakao, N-A-K-A-O, uh, and he, he and his associates published a paper which, where they used 10-week-old blood and incubated it with uh, the xanthine riboside called inosine and the purine base adenine. And they found that the shape of the red cell, uh, which becomes crenated and circular uh, after a long time storage in a blood bag, was able to be converted back to the biconcave disc. And they repeated that several times and showed in addition there were some chemical changes. Now, uh, uh, the, the reason the, uh, it was known that the red cell normally uses glucose as an energy source, but it was also known that after several weeks of storage, glucose could no longer be utilized. On the other hand, the purine riboside, uh, uh, which is made up of this uh, xanthine base and a ribose, which is a sugar, could enter the cell after long time storage and be used as an energy source. Now the amount of inosine that was required would be such that it could not be used in humans because of toxicity, particularly toxicity on the kidney and also it would produce essentially gout in anybody who received it. Um, I was intrigued by the paper because I was not interested in rejuvenation of old cells. My interest was in the maintenance of the uh, shelf life at the beginning of storage. So um, inosine was not necessary, glucose was available, so I thought that uh, why not just use adenine? So, um, in the process of, of studying the cutter bags, I decided I would put uh, adenine into some of the cutter bags and split the blood units so that some were studied without adenine, some were studied with. Now, the problem was that adenine turned out to be extremely insoluble. And it was very hard for me to get it into solution. The Japanese reported that they were able to use, to uh, uh, supplement with 10 units, I'll use the word units, mm -hmm. per milliliter of adenine. Now I tried every uh, way possible to try to dissolve 10 units per mil in an aqueous solution, which was required uh, to uh, uh, put into the anticoagulant preservative solution because it was an aqueous mm -hmm. environment. Well, the best I could do was to get four units per milliliter. And so what I did though was I started with 0.5 units, one, two, and four, and supplemented, and then studied the bags at various periods. And it turned out, it was an aha moment, or the moment of discovery, that the optimal adenine was one unit per mil. Uh, 0.5 unit was almost as good. Both of those achieved a shelf life of about six weeks or 42 days. Uh, the two uh, units was much less effective 
and four was actually toxic. So had I achieved ten, had I been clever enough or figure out some way to dissolve ten units per mil, the, the discovery would not have been made. It turned out later that uh, the uh, translation of the Japanese paper was incorrect. It missed the decimal point. And so they, in fact, had used one mil in the rejuvenation studies. Um, so the work uh, with uh, adenine at the one unit per mil was repeated several times to be sure uh, that it wasn't a fluke. And each experiment verified it. There were no exceptions with multiple units of blood from multiple donors. Uh, now to put some dates to this as to what happened. Uh, it, I first reported the studies to the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council in 1960. Uh, the definitive paper was published in 1962. And uh, subsequently, people both in the United States, particularly in Sweden and also in West Germany, repeated the work and confirmed it. Uh, with, uh, having made the observation, it was important to figure out how did adenine work. I was fortunate to have recruited a fellow from Japan, Yoshiki Sugita, and he and I worked out the mechanism by which adenine achieved its effect. And uh, the initial paper, uh, the 1962 paper, uh, was um, uh, the four, uh, number four in my publication list. And the uh, paper uh, describing the mechanism was, I believe, uh, number 13. You had a lot in between. Uh, so that if anybody wants to see uh, the studies and what was done, those are the ones. Uh, so um, after the initial observation, it was obviously important to see if it could be repeated. And so we repeated it many times, uh, actually six units in about 40 different recipients. Uh, and um, it was shown to be effective each time. Uh, the uh, uh, 0.5 or one unit per mil adenine was added uh, to the anticoagulant preservative solution. The work was first uh, presented uh, to the National Academy of Sciences, the New York um, National Academy of Science, the National Research Council, which were very interested in blood work because of the military application, uh, in 1960. The definitive paper was published in 1962. Uh, it was publication number four in my publication list. Um, uh, between 60 to, by 64, as I recall, the work had been confirmed in Sweden and in West Germany. And uh, in 63, I recruited a fellow, a research fellow from Japan, Yoshiki Sugita, uh, and he and I worked out the mechanism by which adenine achieved its effect. And that was published uh, in 1965 in publication number 13. Now, uh, uh, 
what, uh, what about, here was a research finding, the issue was would it be practically useful and could it be implemented in uh, the national and international blood banking uh, community. And in fact, by 1965, the Sweden had implemented adenine supplementation in all of its blood supply. By 67, uh, West Germany uh, partially implemented it, primarily due to the work of Dr. Siegfried Seidel, oh. and that was the beginning of the friendship of the Seidels, which developed from that day in, 19, in the 1960s, and her last phone call was about two weeks ago in, on the occasion of Eve's birthday. So the uh, relationship has continued with the Seidels, with visits to them in 678. We spent three beautiful days with them in Vienna in 2008 and we always recognize each other's holidays and birthdays. And so that's what's, what adenine started, a beautiful friendship. Now I haven't mentioned the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, although the discovery was made here, it was approved finally in 1978, 18 years later, and implemented fully by 1979, or 19 years later. Now, that's a story in itself, as to, and that um, is detailed in a number of my publications, which would be numbers 27, 31, 34 and 43, but that's another story for another time. Now, uh, um, um, I would say there's a, one other irony that uh, relates to the adenine story. When I took the job at Blood Systems in 1981, uh, part of my desire, with the approval of that current president, president of the organization, was to establish a laboratory for some research in blood. And uh, I had a outline of the kind of laboratory I wanted to establish. Uh, two weeks later, I had a visit from a former president of the organization and who very proudly told me that blood systems, as it now was called, had never spent a single dime. He was very proud to say that the organization had never spent a single dime of patients' money on research which I listened to, but was also very interested in that the first board meeting that I attended, the financial officer said that with the implementation of adenine supplementation, the wastage went from about 10% to 1% to 2% in the first quarter with a saving of $600,000. This having been achieved for the uh, um, Army grant of about $10,000. So I think there is some uh, justification for research uh, in terms of even producing uh, less wasted and financial savings. So that's the story of Adeline. Oh.
Okay, I have two questions. One, does that mean the military in all those 20 years in the U.S. never implemented that? Or was it just the civilians that didn't? No, uh, the military did not. Because one of the things that happened, one of the very finest researchers uh, um, in the United States did an experiment on himself by injecting free adenine without blood preservative in himself and found crystals in, in the urine, uh, uh, adenine being highly insoluble. And uh, that set back the Army's interest for a decade. And they didn't deal with, any, they didn't look at the research that was going on or the implementation in other countries? They were it was, uh, completely uh, Americentric? As I say, it is a story which is quite complicated. I'll mention we'll a couple of features about it. One is that uh, in the United States, the content of what's in the bag was regulated by the National Bureau of Standards at the NIH. In, but the bag itself was regulated by the FDA. So uh, you had the problem. And furthermore, the sponsorship for a so-called uh, new license application had to come from industry. Now, industry had very little interest because uh, with uh, supplementing with adenine, uh, 10 percent of the bags, they would lose bag sales because <laughs> yeah, uh, they, sure. there was less wastage. So there was high, uh, little incentive. Were these plastic bags? Plastic Early bags. Plastics? So okay. There was little incentive for the industry to, uh, uh, to, to push that. Mm -hmm. And I wrote two review articles. Those were references. 18 and 29, uh, emphasizing the importance that adenine might have and giving the background both of the studies and the experience. And uh, those were published in 1967 and 77, respectively. Yeah. The 77 one, I did have the opportunity at FDA to shepherd through the process. Because by then you of, were over there. Yeah, of uh, having a licensure go ahead. And the Army, there were two other things that were important. T.P. Greenwald, who was a dean in transfusion medicine and head of the Red Cross uh, blood program, which at the time controlled 50% of the blood supply, uh, indicated to industry that that manufacturer who first came out with adenine supplementation would get the Red Cross business. <laughs> and so Powerful economic that was a, an incentive. And that along with the Army, they got together, did some additional studies, made sure there were no toxicity to platelets, that the plasma derivatives from the blood would be unchanged, and those were done. And so finally, in 78, the adenine supplemented preservative was approved by the uh, uh, FDA, and um, implementation occurred in 1979. Wow, I had no idea it went that long, and I had no idea that you were while you were at NIH, um, that that was something you were shepherding. I didn't realize that at all. Mm -hmm. My second question, and it's, we, you can answer it just briefly, is did you actually get to establish the lab at Blood Systems? Um, when I came to Blood Systems in Scottsdale in 81, I did have a plan for a laboratory, and it was basically one to study uh, the prevention of hepatitis in the transfusion of blood, hopefully in conjunction with a hepatitis unit from the Center of Disease Control, which was based in Phoenix. 
But two events happened that uh, sidetracked that. Number one was that the month I came to Phoenix was the first paper that led to uh, what came to be known as AIDS. That first paper was published in June of 1981, and uh, the second paper in July of 1981. And uh, my life changed for the next 14 years. I was engaged in uh, policies that would make the blood supply as safe as possible. And what are the ethical and legal implications of testing blood, uh, notification of donors, notification of contacts of donors, and so forth. Uh, the second reason that uh, the laboratory was not established in Phoenix was that the uh, hepatitis units from C CDC moved back to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So that collaboration uh, did not occur.